Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first-time filmmaker's journey. I am your host, Josh Lindsay, from the Movie Proposal Podcast, and with me is our first-time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hey, it's me. Hello, Christian. And as always, our trusty, dusty research extraordinaire, Jason Rugg. Hello. So Rugg. Oh, I'm like, hello there. And no I want, no my, longer yeah, a Muppet. Yeah. Want my Muppet back. Yeah. <laughs> Jason, where, where's your, your last name from? Uh, oh, don't say your dad. Um, <laughs> like, uh, it's, I believe it's Welsh, and it means uh, like rouge, red. It's, oh. yeah, like red It goes along face, with your ruddy complexion. Skin. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So, yeah. It Fun doesn't fact mean hair of the piece. day. <laughs> <laughs> so calling you a floor mat would not be appropriate. I mean, you can call me whatever you want. We just call you red. It's, I've heard it. Just don't all. call you late for dinner. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> All right. So we're talking about a first time filmmaker's journey into making a film. Who right? just discovered she has positive reviews on iTunes. Get out of town. <laughs> I, I just do. discovered it was on iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> Here, uh, I'll read one of these reviews okay. real quick. We want to thank Laura for reviewing the podcast. Uh, she said, thanks for sharing your heart here. It's so encouraging to hear what you've learned and how your faith has informed this journey. Oh, that's awesome. That's a really nice review. Yeah. Thank you, Laura. Can you read another one? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, this is from Jake with a lot of numbers after it. Uh, listening to this has generally gotten me more interested in supporting this project and seeing the film when it's ready. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Yay. If Yay. you're listening to this, can you leave us a thing on iTunes? I will promise I will read them. And if you have questions for us, leave them on our Facebook page or Instagram or Twitter, wherever your social media is. And these reviews help other people become aware of it. So the more reviews, the more uh, yeah. listeners we can you know, reach, reach and uh, learn about the film project. Yeah. So. so how the iTunes algorithm works is the more reviews it gets, the more likely it is to serve it to people who aren't subscribed to it. So that's a great way to grow the project and just yeah. spread awareness. Thanks, Jason. I didn't even know that. <laughs> Please go review it right, right now. Yes. All right. So we were talking about um, recently just – you were talking about you know flying over the Atlantic, you know, and you can't stop now, and um, that you're you're so invested and so forth. Um, a lot of what you've talked about is um, you know the time, the energy, your own money, uh, involving friends and family and so forth. I mean, it's really the journey of an entrepreneur, for sure. Right, and you are definitely an artist, but to get it done, you know, someone happens to be you as well. Uh, has to have a mindset of of completing the task, right? You know, yeah. Um, so, you know, I used to work for VeggieTales. I do know this. And I was in production management. My whole job there was to make sure that the artists got their, their work done in time. Because if there was no schedule or budget <laughs> or deadline, an artist would never quit working on it. It would just go on and I could always true, get better. It's true because it's never perfect. It's, ne- it's never the, exactly right, you know. And so you have to have management <laughs> – Someone uh, to keep it on track. And so so let, I want to talk about the entrepreneurial side of being a filmmaker. Sure. Right? Okay. So you, you had your foray into uh, becoming a first-time voiceover actress or I voiceover have. – what do you call it? Voiceover artist. Artist. And you have proven yourself successful in that endeavor. Yes. You can obviously do more, but you have – I mean, you have achieved a level – people dream of, and that's not like the dream of being like Tom Hanks in... Right, I'm not to, famous. Right, right, right. But I mean, to make a career, like you you made a living wage. Yes. I'm, a, I'm what you call a working actor. There you go. Although I will tell you this, I I actually won awards this past couple Get of weeks. Out what? Of Did town. you hear this? I, was, I couldn't believe this. Speaking of awards for our last podcast, I, this was so crazy, but... After I, like, I did not want to narrate The Girl Who Wore Freedom. That just was not in my, I was thinking of Peter Coyote all the way, not Christian Taylor. But anyway, because it happened the way it happened, I did narrate it basically to be expedient and because people told me, it's your story, you should do it. So I did. Um, And Bill Ebel, the editor, he is a very certain way of how he likes me to do VO work that's not announcery, not voiceover and so he always directs me to not be a voiceover person Mm -hmm. so i did the film that way now i recorded in tennessee when i was down there for the six weeks and i come home i come home and somebody reaches out to me and said hey we have a documentary we're doing and we think that you'll be a great narrator for it and i was like 
oh, well, okay. <laughs> and so when I asked what style he wanted, he's like, well, we're thinking kind of, you know, a softer, lower. Anyway, as we went into it, he wanted it exactly like Bill. So this documentary is narrated in the same style as The Girl Who Wore Freedom. Okay. So it's called Losing Ground, and it's a documentary about urban sprawl. And so I asked him, I'm like, well, is this on IMDb? Because I wanted a credit. And he's like, no, I don't know how to do that. I'm like, you should look it up, figure out how to do it, because I need the credit. <laughs> and, uh, and then I was like, and have you entered into any film festivals? And he's like, well, somebody had talked to us about that. I think, I think we're going to try. Are you going to show this film to anybody? <laughs> <laughs> and um, the next thing I know, they had, enter it, um, they had entered it into like nine film festivals, and wow. it's won two awards already. Wow. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it was all my voiceover. Right. But no, <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, so I, yes, I have a successful voiceover career. I don't make a million dollars, but I do make good money and I can continue to do that. So uh, talk uh, about the entrepreneurial side in terms of, it's one thing to be an artist and have ideas, but, you know, unless you get, you know, pen to paper, or unless money is raised and spent and action is taken and, and things are seen through, you know, like... It's just an idea. Yeah. Well, I honestly think that um, that entrepreneurial side of my brain is the reason we're sitting here today. Because if I sit, I think I'm more of an entrepreneur than I am an artist. Okay. Um, I love the business side of it. I love the marketing. Um, I have been approached by a million people throughout my lifetime saying, can you please work for us? Like every company, Amway, you know, Avon, you know, Pampered Chef, you name well, you're, it. You're, you're a, a people gatherer. Like people are attracted to you and you're great at involving people and getting people to to join you, whatever it is you're doing. Right. And I'm communica good communicator, so I talk to people about mm. whatever the thing is. And so, like, for real estate, my dad's dying for me to go in real estate, you know? And my husband keeps saying, if you'd have gone in real estate, we would be super rich right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, everybody's trying to always get me to sell something. And I just could never do it. I had no interest because I had to be – I can't be fake I have to truly believe about what I'm selling, and I have to have complete 100% buy-in to be the person that you just and described. And not that realtors or Avon or whatever are fake. It's just that you just That's didn't... what they're passionate about. Right. You, weren't, you didn't buy into those things. Right. That's what they want to do. Right. I, I don't want to do that. But this found me. It latched its hooks into my heart, and it's just become a part of who I am. And so I... And I have a commitment. I, I feel a commitment to the people whose stories I'm telling. I have a commitment to people who have donated money. I don't want to stop. I want to be faithful to the mission that I set out to do. But I mean, in this business, people come to me all the time. How can I be a voiceover actor? And please, if you're going to come to me for that, don't come to me saying, people always tell me I have a good voice. Because I get that a million times a day. Uh, everybody has a good voice. It does not matter if you have that a good true. voice. That is true. I've never listened to you and thought, oh, Chris Christian should be a voiceover actress, you know, like, yeah, I mean, it truly doesn't matter what your voice is. Everybody has a voice. And if you learn, it's a tool. And if you learn how to use it, thankfully, today, they want real people. And so if you learn the art of voiceover, and you can do the work. However, I tell everybody, whether they're a voiceover or a regular actor, if you don't understand how to run a business, you will never be successful. Yeah, Because doing something for money, all of a sudden, whether you want to run one or not, it's a business. And so you have to think about it in that mindset. You know, you're always going to be putting out money, you know, to make money. And you're going to have to pay taxes on whatever you make. And, you know, if you want to grow your business and actually do more of it, then you have to think like a business person. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're a small business owner, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So tell me about that process for you. Well, uh, I had never wanted to go into business for myself primarily because it was just it was, it was scary, it was threatening, you know. And, and we're not in school being taught how to become business owners. We're taught how to be employees, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so for me, you, you have to learn these things. So, like, you just listed off a bunch of things that might intimidate someone in terms of, like, paying taxes or having a business plan or whatever. But all these things can be learned. They can be hired out or whatever. You just have to take the time to learn these things. So I think reading is very important. You got to, because what we're not taught, you got to go find out on your own. So you got to read. Number two, getting around other people who have done it, 
So some people are listening to this podcast because they want to make a film. So they're naturally like, well, hey, well, let's listen to someone who did it. What did she do right? What did she do wrong? How can I learn from that? Um, and then, you know, and if you hang out with the wrong crowd, you know, they, they can pull you down. It's like crabs in a bucket versus if you hang around other entrepreneurs, they're going to push you up, right? Right. So reading, hanging around with the right people. And, and you know, the, 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 the only thing I can brag about in my level of success is that I didn't quit. Like, mm-hmm. I've been doing this for 18 years now, and the amount of people I see quit yeah. is unreal, right? And right. honestly, I believe with most things, if you don't quit, you're going to have so, – it's, it's inevitable, right? Now, obviously, different industries and, and different things can get in the way depending on – but like generally speaking, if you don't quit, it doesn't mean you're going to be a millionaire, but you're going to find some level of growth, success, or whatever. But people quit because they expect it to – be easy right. or not this hard or you know i have a college degree i'm a good person you know i love god why why is this so hard? <laughs> well you know i'm going to tell you another thing too you have to have on some level an app at what am i looking for appetite that's it thank you very much appetite for risk Oh yeah, and because you're you're yeah. putting, like you said, you're putting literally money and time that, yeah. that you there is no guarantee you're going to get anything back. Right. And 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 it's exhilarating on one level, mm-hmm. you know, to think that um, this I could win an Oscar. Like it is absolutely a legitimate thing that I could win. You know, now I'm not saying I will. I'm not saying my project is so great it will, but. I could win an Oscar. I'm not out of the that The odds category. of you winning an Oscar are much greater than me winning an Oscar right now because I don't have <laughs> a film. You did it. You went out and made a film. True, 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 true. So, uh, but, you know, you have to be willing to say, I could lose everything and, and I'll be okay with that. So in my instance, I have put out three years of time. I have about... I would say $50,000 in debt that I'm servicing right now. And I still need another $100,000 to finish the film. But, and I know that even if I do, you know, make some money back, the debt has to be paid off. I have to pay some people for stuff, you know, and then we get profit. And then I share that with others, you know, um, so I'm not going to be getting a lot of money from this film, if at all. So I've known all the way along this could be a losing proposition for me. But at the end of the day, it's been so rewarding, the community that we have built around this film, the people that are involved, the lessons that have been learned, the lives that have been changed, far outweigh, you know, the money. And if it crashed and burned today – it would it would have not been in vain, right? Because of the, the person you become, the experiences you've had, the people you've met. I've gotten a graduate degree in filmmaking. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. You know? And and I'm sure you know the things that it will lead to beyond this. I mean, who, you can't probably can't even imagine. Well, well, I never imagined how much I would love this. Like, I really love this. I really love telling a story. I really love making a film. I've I now have spent a whole you know, three years studying and learning. And now I'm like, give me another shot. You know, I want, it's like a tattoo. I want another one. (laughs) You know, what's funny. um, I'll say this and we got to wrap up, but you know, in my, my stint at veggie tales, I was around a lot of wannabe filmmakers and they had ideas and so forth, you know, and, and they had enough knowledge to know how difficult it really is. And a lot of that was intimidating to me because these guys were a lot more talented than I was. And I thought these guys can't get a film done. You know, what are the chances of me doing it? And then Christian in her, I don't know, naivete. You yes, know, like, total naivete. <laughs> well, I'm just going to go do it. And then you go do it and you've actually made a film while other people are still sitting around 20 years later. Oh, I still got this idea. I just can't find someone to latch on to it. You know, like, do you know what my favorite play is of all time? I don't. Nan of La Mancha. Oh, the because- musical. He dreamed an impossible dream. I relate to him so much. I was in that play actually twice. And that song. I was in it once. To dream an impossible. What were you? (laughs) I was just an extra. I was like a a knight and a prisoner and all that kind of stuff. I, I, you know, to dream an impossible dream. I mean, I'm a dreamer. And so I, I did know how difficult it was actually. I knew how difficult it was. I knew how much money it would cost. Now, I didn't know how to do it, per se, 
But, uh, but I didn't care. I was like, this is a story that has to be told. Somebody has to do it. I can figure it out. Yeah. That's the naivete. And I do think I just didn't know what I didn't know. And I didn't let it stop me. Yeah. And here we are, you know, three years later, and I wouldn't change a thing. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Now, were you uh, Dulcinea? <laughs> I was not Dulcinea. <laughs> I was um, – there, there was another girl. Why can't I remember her name? I was also a horse. She, <laughs> she, she becomes a horse. I think maybe I don't know. I remember there was someone turning into a. Horse. I was a wench, some sort of wench, but not Nelson. I can't remember her name. Well, you can so long look ago. It, up. it was, it was in high school. Mine was in high school. Well, hey everyone, thanks for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell, and you can be the one to tell it. Bye, everybody. Thank you for listening to Documentary First. We really appreciate your partnership with us. We can't do any of this without you. So thank you so much for listening, for donating, and for following along on our journey. If you are able to make a donation this week, we really would appreciate it. We are supported by donors who give us $100 or less, so anything helps. Also, if you're able to share the news about the girl who wore freedom with your friends and family, please do that on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, or email, and sign up for our newsletter at Normandy Store. Please go to normandystories.com slash donate to make a donation today.